Okay, we will let others continue. I'll just continue to let folks in. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jody Skipper to introduce today's speaker. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to South Talks. I am Dr. Jody Skipper, and I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing Dr. Barbara Harris Combs. Dr. Combs is professor of sociology and chair of the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice at Kennesaw State University. In addition to her PhD in sociology from Georgia State University, she holds a Juris Doctorate degree from The Ohio State University <laughs> and an MA in English from Xavier University in Ohio. In addition to her current book project, Bodies Out of Place, Theorizing Anti-Blackness in U.S. Society, the focus of her talk today, Dr. Combs is also the author of From Selma to Montgomery, The Long March to Freedom. Her forthcoming book, Black Places and Spaces of Political Empowerment with co-authors Todd C. Shaw and Kirk Foster is under contract with Oxford University Press. I welcome scholar and my friend, Dr. Barbara Harris Combs. Aw, thank you, Jody Skipper. I was like, why is she reading as well as she knows me? <laughs> Thank you all for being here today. It is a great, uh, great pleasure and, and honor uh, to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be in person, but I am grateful for the opportunity to uh, exchange with you all uh, today. Um, so sorry, I was still typing a message to folks. So I, I just wanna go ahead and jump in. I'm gonna set my timer because those of you who know me know I can wax long. Uh, and so I'm going to set that. I'm um, grateful for the opportunity to talk to you about my uh, my recent book uh, titled Bodies Out of Place, uh, Theorizing Anti-Blackness in U.S. Uh, Society. Many of the ideas that, um, that come from this book uh, also developed during a time when I was at uh, the University of Mississippi. Uh, and for fear of missing uh, some names, uh, I just want to thank uh, my sister scholar, uh, community for uh, for their support uh, over uh, over the years. Uh, so the uh, this book comes out of a kind of natural um, place for uh, for me. Uh, there's a question that I ask that if we recognize that racism is an adaptable and changing beast, that it changes to sustain itself, that it seeks to sustain itself, then why aren't we developing new theories to help us make uh, racism uh, visible? Uh, and, uh, and, and so for me, uh, statements like, oh, but things are so much better than they used to be, fail to recognize uh, that things aren't necessarily better than they used to be. Uh, oppression just against uh, black and brown uh, peoples and other populations just happens in different ways, different ways. Uh, and so the roots of this theory that I developed that I call uh, BOP, bodies out of place, the roots of the theory uh, come from a time when I was, uh, was, was teaching uh, at the university. And I remember I was teaching a course that I developed, uh, Race, Place, and Space. And I would send students out to do many assignments about to watch how people interacted uh, in, uh, in spaces. And they would bring back the insights, insights that I developed from my own um, uh, time in, uh, in uh, various spots. And, and my philosophical beliefs, the roots of this theory are rooted in my philosophical uh, belief that, uh, that that people are fundamentally good. I want to believe uh, that, uh, perhaps naively sometimes, but holding on to that, trying to understand uh, the roots of human uh, interactions. And so uh, then I go through a process of trying to reconcile uh, these uh, various analyses and come to conclusions. And, and I read a piece once by a sociologist 
Harris, uh, Thomas Guerin, that we needed a place for space in sociology, and came to the conclusion, as Guerin did, that place is under theorized. It's under theorized in our social science uh, discussions. And for me, it was important to acknowledge that when I talk about bodies out of place, I want people to understand that place is not just a geographical place certain. I'm sitting in Kennesaw, uh, um, Kennesaw, you know, uh, Georgia, uh, or perhaps you're in Oxford, right? Uh, it's not just a geographical place certain. Certain, but place is also uh, a social relational uh, position. And so you may have heard the term, a woman's place is in the home, or that's my, you're in my seat, right? And so place is a really useful heuristic for examining uh, what is going on in society. This idea that certain opportunities uh, naturally belong to certain people and that others uh, should be kept from them or if they have them, that they obtain them through some uh, Ill, uh, Ill gain. Uh, and so again, place is an under theorized, under explored variable when theorizing, you know, race relations in, in society. So I talk about uh, the concept of uh, anti-Blackness because it is broader. Racism is certainly a part of it. Um, but when I talk about anti-Blackness, uh, it's really uh, important to, uh, to, to kind of interrogate that. Uh, and so I've highlighted some parts uh, of a definition uh, that another scholar, and I apologize if I butcher her name, name, uh, Awar, um, it wrote in a, it started in a piece that she did in the Washington uh, Post, an op-ed, but I took uh, this quote from the National Black Cultural Information Trust, uh, describing anti-Blackness as a manifestation of racist prejudices, ideologies. Uh, again, I'm uh, excerpting some parts, you know, dehumanizing I, uh, ideas, dehumanizing uh, behaviors and, and beliefs and a reliance, a heavy reliance on the historical erasure uh, of African uh, and African uh, descent uh, people in society. And so um, I, I Again, I left the University of Mississippi in 2015 uh, for uh, my our son had a learning difference that the state of Mississippi didn't recognize, and we needed to go someplace where he could graduate from high school. Uh, so, uh, so when I started this work, the title, the working title of my book was Blackout. Uh, but as the publication date came, there were a couple of aptly titled books with that same title, and so that was abandoned. But this concept of what I uh, what I call uh, blackout is important, and. And so I say in the process, I, I outline and describe in the book this process of a blackout. Black bodies are welcome in physical and social white space, but Black embodiment is not. And this Black embodiment is the use of the body or flesh uh, to convey certain cultural, ideo ideological, and other messages about identity, about consciousness, about belonging. And that's an important for you to hold on to in this uh, new wave of racism, anti-Blackness, it is important to understand, uh, again, uh, that Black bodies are not per se unwelcome in certain spaces as there were in other historical periods, but I say it is this Black embodiment uh, that is rejected. So when there are times when Black bodies are welcome in white space, I discuss in the book and a nod to uh, the, uh, the work of, uh, of Glenn Bracey and Wendy Leo Moore, uh, a piece that they did because much of this idea arrives from, th from that. When are Black bodies welcome in white space? Well, one is when there are not too many of us. 
<laughs> so uh, so as long as they're not too many, you're, you're welcome. Uh, so as to change the sensibility, the perception of that space as being, uh, being white. Um, so the second time when black bodies are welcome in white space, that's provided those black bodies don't disturb or challenge the sensibilities of what or practices, how that space is usually used, how people act in the space, what they say, as long long as you're not disturbing that, you are uh, are welcome, because uh, in essence, it's just white space with Black faces in it. And the third time that Black bodies are welcome in white space is if they're performing, if we're performing stereotypical functions at stereotypical times. Uh, I will... Uh, so I will look at, uh, I, there's a nod to intersectional matters and the somatic or bodily norm. Uh, these are the roots of the book, the roots of, of the theory. Some of you may uh, recognize this, uh, this image, uh, beautiful uh, young woman, Courtney uh, Pearson, who was the first uh, African-American, first black a homecoming princess at the University uh, of Mississippi. Uh, and I remember at the time, again, much of the narrative was a narrative about progress in the space, that even the University of Mississippi had elected a Black uh, homecoming uh, queen. Uh, but there was also another narrative, and that narrative suggested that based upon her race and based upon uh, based upon her beautiful dark skin, based upon her body size, that she didn't belong, that she had no business in that position that rightly belonged to someone else. And so it made me mindful of a book that I read when I was in graduate school, Space Invaders, Race, Gender, and Bodies Out of Place. So those are the roots of, uh, of the theory. I won't read uh, this, uh, this quote, um, but the idea, again, uh, this book is rooted in my, uh, in my observations, my lived experience, my considerable research, that everywhere the Black body is a contested site. Everywhere the Black body uh, is a contested site. And so this quote from George Yancey, uh, Black bodies, white gazes, uh, really crystallizes uh, that. And I'll linger there for a moment for those who are, uh, who are reading it, but those are the roots of, uh, of the theory. And, and so Caritha Mitchell wrote a piece uh, after Trayvon Martin instant, uh, instant uh, killing, um, and it was a collection of articles about, uh, about that. And she talked about something that she called the pushback. Uh, and Mitchell says that in the United States, the success of marginalized groups inspires aggression as often as praise. Aggression is often as praise. Uh, and so think about, again, Courtney Pearson. Uh, uh, think about when the first uh, Black female president uh, of the student uh, body at the University of Mississippi was elected, and then she went out to celebrate uh, on the square and coming uh, out of a restaurant, someone told her, you're that first in president, right? Uh, the United States, in the United States, the success of marginalized groups inspires aggression as often as praise, because the purpose of violence is to mark who belongs and who does not. So it is best understood, Mitchell says, as a distinct form, a severe form of know your place aggression, know your place. So the book that I write is organized into, uh, into three parts. Uh, the, uh, the second part is what I'm going to concentrate on for the rest of my time with you. And that is the frames that I identify for how this idea of a body out of place, uh, how it it materializes and how uh, how there is a justification used for the violent attack against uh, against the perceived body out of place. And, and I want to say that when I talk about violence, I view violence very broadly, uh, certainly to include physical violence, but also to include economic 
physical violence uh, and psychological, psychic violence against uh, against uh, black bodies is the population that I talk about uh, in uh, in this book. And then the third part is uh, is is my uh, attempt to talk about the agency of uh, of black persons. Um, and and I also I, I asked, do you see what I see? Uh, and so that uh, section is organized in uh, in that way and ends with uh, with a policy matters chapter in chapter 11 and then uh, then a, a a just salute to all of uh, the agency, the beautiful uh, agency uh, of black uh, persons in this country. So I have eight tenants, a nod to critical race theory uh, about how this body out of place idea operates. Uh, I tell people uh, that this is a book I am writing to all my friends, friends who I've never met before and friends that I know very dearly. And friends don't always agree, but I say, hear the underlying assumptions that I build upon, that I explicate in this book, are these eight basic uh, tenets. And, and this is a, a shorthand on the tenets. First, that racism is ingrained in society. Second, that physical integration is often falsely equated with social integration. That you take a picture of a classroom, a picture of a company, and there are black and brown uh, and red and, uh, and yellow faces. And so therefore we must be a socially integrated society. And so it's a falsity, uh, a falsehood to equate physical integration in spaces with social integration. The third uh, is that whites have a possessive investment in whiteness. And certainly Du Bois said this first and best, uh, that there is a possessive investment in, in whiteness. And so this uh, is part of the root of denials in the existence, the continuing existence of racism. Because if there's an acknowledgement that racism continues to exist, then there is also a requirement to disinvest uh, and to claim responsibility and to offer redress in the form of reparations. Uh, the fourth is that there is a symbiotic macro and micro. And so macro being big structures, micro being individual level, there's a symbiotic macro micro connection. Racism is sustained on a micro level and it operates on a macro level, but it's also sustained on a macro level and operates on a, uh, on a micro level. And by that, I mean that when we point fingers at individual individual bad actors and say, we've cleaned up the police because we removed this person, it fails to acknowledge that individuals are people embedded in social systems. Uh, five, context matters, that people need not be per se out of place, uh, but it is a relational thing. How did you get into the University of Mississippi when my child couldn't get in. It's like you took my uh, my place. So context matters. Um, and the six is that uh, the perception of a of a the perception perceiving somebody as out of place evokes a response. That response is on a continuum from mild, and mild might be amusement. Oh, look at that interracial couple. Like you don't belong together because it's, it, but there is a requirement uh, that somehow you acknowledge it because there's a perception you don't belong together. And on that continuum of mild, uh, an amusement might not even be the mildest, right? Because that's offensive uh, to the other end up to and including death. That is the continuum of violence that I am talking about. That is the slippery slope. Uh, and the seventh is that white logics, white racial common sense is used to justify uh, the push uh, pushback. Uh, so uh, white racial logic might be, well, Ahmaud Aubrey didn't wave to me when he was in the neighborhood. So he doesn't, that means he doesn't belong there. 
uh, instead of, well, maybe he didn't wave because you didn't wave first, right? Other logics are the logics that uh, that I am encouraging people uh, to use and, and not adopt that, uh, that white uh, racial logic or frame and nod there to the work of Eduardo Benia Silva and um, um, uh, to Corey. Um, so the eighth tenant is that, uh, that your know, body's out of place. It's necessarily intersectional, uh, in nature and applicable across multiple, uh, social structures. So this operates as both a theory in the flesh. Um, and so if you think this bridge called my back, a theory in the uh in the flesh and as uh and as method. And so BOP bodies out of place as theory is a way of making sense out of the phenomena in under examination, anti-blackness. Um, I'm interested in the mundane. There's been a lot of talk, as there well should be, against about police violence against black bodies. But I argue that that is not the violence to which most black people are subject to every day. It is an everyday quotidian form of violence that we are subject to. When you go into a store and uh, the clerk follows you or uh, doesn't want to put the money in your hand because he or she doesn't want to touch you. That is the kind of violence that Black bodies are subject to every day and that must be interrogated. That is the kind of violence to which everyone uh, is uh, a port participant. Um, and so uh, the as method, uh, as method, BOP encourage, or encourages researchers to widen the sources of data that are used to interpret what is going on uh, in society and widen that in terms of the the, uh, of the perspectives, lived experiences of people, widen it in terms of the resources, not just textbooks, but uh, but music and poetry and uh, and art. Uh, as method, BOP employs an oppositional kind of uh, uh, of narratives seeking. The idea is to seek new knowledge, to seek new understandings. Uh, and, and, and so I also am attentive to uh, emotional states. And so uh, BOP rationalizations that, uh, that I develop and advance uh, in the text, there are, uh, there are five typologies that I offer uh, for how this operates. The first frame, the first frame I call the historical uh, fear factor. And, and I hope when I say uh, historical that you will also hear uh, hysterical uh, in there, because in part it is very much uh, a hysterical type uh, of response uh, to the presence of, uh, of some black, uh, black person in, uh, in the space. Uh, the, there, I interrogate a number of cases, but the one that really, uh, that really uh, gets to the heart of this that, uh, that hurt uh, perhaps the most is, uh, is a case of a young man uh, who was a, um, he had been a football player at FAMU, a historically black uh, college in Florida, moved to North Carolina. Uh, and one night he was out with some friends. And then um, after he dropped some friends off, he gets into a car accident uh, on a remote piece of road. It's night. Uh, no one sees. He kicks his way out of the back of the car and makes his way to the first home that he comes to. He knocks on the door because, after all, all would-be rapists 
all would be uh, uh, robbers knock on the door to introduce themselves, right? He knocks on the door, uh, white woman, young white woman with a baby in her hand, couldn't be more sympathetic to those, you know, uh, because most of us have been socialized in that, uh, in that frame that says, uh, perceives black men as threats to, uh, to her. She opens the door, sees him there, closes it quickly, uh, calls the police and stays, the police stay on or calls 911. They stay on the phone with her for about uh, 10 minutes uh, and he remains and you can hear him in the background. Hello, you know, can I, uh, uh, I'm sorry, can I, can I get some help? So he stays on the phone. She's hysterical. Is he going to hurt me? Is he going to hurt my baby? Is he going to rape me? The police come he jogs to them, not away. He jogs to them and uh, police shoot um, and wounding him, um, killing him uh, about eight times. I think he's hit by about 12, uh, 12 different um, shots. And so the idea the police officer is, uh, is acquitted and the perception is, you know, oh, well, why did he run toward them? <laughs> and so in through using BOP, I interrogate that and say, excuse me, uh, you are adopting a frame that suggests we, if someone else were running towards him, perhaps he's running towards them because uh, we're told that the police are there to help. And he thought, hey, I need some uh, help. Can we consider why would he remain uh, in the space for all of this uh, time? And so this historical or hysterical uh, fear factor and the fear could be certainly of losing uh, life, but also losing some of the wages, the benefits of whiteness. The second uh, frame that I set forth is the presumed criminal. And under this frame, it says, the presumed criminal typological frame operates as follows. Black bodies are suspicious. So you start out as suspicious, right? Uh, you have to overcome that. Black bodies are suspicious until proven otherwise and are properly, because we're suspicious, properly subject to constant and heightened surveillance. The presumption of malevolence, the presumption that you're a bad actor, therefore, in this frame, makes it acceptable to call state sanctioned actors like police for routine acts like shopping, walking, driving, uh, the for sleeping. <laughs> The frame demonstrates how once the presumption of criminality is invoked, any resistance to authority, think Tyree Nichols, why are you, you know, why are you stopping me? Hey, you're doing too much. Once that presumption is invoked, any resistance to authority only heightens the presumption of criminality and is then used to rationalize and justify the carceral response used to justify uh, violence against black bodies. Uh, I will later, some of these overlap, I'll later talk about the case of Martise Johnson, a college student. Um, so the third frame is Massa has spoken. And so uh, Massa has spoken and therefore, you know, when uh, when Massa uh, speaks, you uh, you better listen. The Massa has spoken frame presumes whites, white moral superiority. Uh, so therefore, any white person, and it's important for me to say, or his or her designee, and that designee, as in slavery, hence the title Massa has spoken, a nod to uh, nod to, uh, uh, to enslavement, um, an unnatural state. So we say enslavement and not talking about slavery, but enslavement. Um, sometimes there were uh, Black overseers. And so it is still a social uh, system and, and it's important to interrogate it, to understand it as such. So again, the master has spoken frame presumes white moral superiority and therefore any white person or his or her designee or overseer, uh, white or otherwise, has the right to be the sole arbiter of what is right, what is reasonable, and or uh, necessary in any given circumstance. Marked with this legal standard of reasonableness, a reasonable man or woman, 
actor or opposer or overseer has the right to not only issue commands to the black body uh, he or she perceives as out of place, but the actor, o opposer, overseer has the full expectation uh, that his or her orders will be complied with in a way that meets the letter, the spirit, the manner, and the speed des desired. And so, uh, think about uh, think about a case in. Texas, uh, the McKinney, Texas pool party incident, first day of summer, uh, and the Craig um, community uh, is largely a white community, uh, but there was a pool party and several uh, Black and um, particularly Black um, uh, people uh, attended the pool party, started uh, to jump the gate when people wouldn't open the door for them. And then the police were called. And in this police incident, uh, the uh, eight cars or so show up. And this officer, Officer Case Bolt, uh, tells a young lady to go home. She turns around and says, I want to get my, and he then jumps on her. The, um, some black uh, youth tried to assist and he pulls out his gun. He then straddles, uh, pornographically straddles her body for about three minutes and no one uh, is allowed to come uh, to her defense. Massa spoke and she is supposed to uh, obey. Uh, and again, a historical nod uh, to uh, most of our history uh, where Black women's bodies could be victimized uh, without recourse uh, by, uh, by white uh, and, uh, and, and often uh, people who look like us as well. So frame four says you don't belong uh, here. And it relies on ideas about where certain people belong, who they belong with, what time they belong there in order to, uh, to promote, uh, promote the idea that certain spaces uh, belong to, uh, to certain people. So it relies on these fixed ideas about where people belong, when they belong there, with whom uh, they belong, and it promotes white supremacy. So some of the examples that I talk about in the book include Trayvon Martin. Again, you don't belong here. Uh, and so uh, it was said uh, by his killer that he was suspicious looking. Um, and that sometimes becomes code. So one of my tenets is that we often use language that is seemingly race neutral, but but it's laden with race-based ideas. And so suspicious in this era becomes code for black. Uh, the same way that uh, sometimes we'll rely on descriptions of where people live. So uh, so the, um, the Harlem, uh, even though it's gentrifying now, but we'll rely on those ideas to convey the prohibited language uh, about race. And so some of the other cases, you know, Martise Johnson, uh, and you see his bloodied face there. He was a student at the University of Virginia, went out with some friends, uh, I think it was St. Patrick's Day, and the alcohol bureau control people in Virginia are have police authority. He goes to a bar, he's of age, but he uh, is asked to show his ID. He stumbles when they ask him his zip code because his mother recently moved and he can't remember which is on there. And so uh, the police respond by attacking him uh, and his bloodied face. What could be more natural? What, what the heck is out of place about a college student going to a bar? He is shackled at his hands and his feet and his face is, uh, is bloodied uh, because he, uh, he deigned to go there and then deigned to speak up when they asked, when, when asking the officers, why are you doing this? And all he kept saying over and over again, his refrain was, but I go to UVA. And I interrogate that because it is a claim of belonging in the space. It is also the fact that uh, uh, white logics and this uh, way of, of, of thinking that 
subjugated persons, subjugated Black persons, we have ingrained those ideas too. Martise Johnson was robbed of the fiction that uh, that success, uh, hard work, was enough that it would take to elevate him out of uh, the perception by people that uh, that he was a bad actor or a bad person. It was his claim of belonging in the space that I did everything you told me how to do. Uh, to do, I pulled up my pants and I did everything you told me how, uh, to do to not be perceived as such. And still. And still it happened. Uh, we have uh, examples of napping while Black uh, at elite spaces like, uh, like Yale and its Smith College, where people were accused of not belonging. Uh, and, and I have Southern uh, spaces, and uh, we've already discussed, uh, discussed that. Or um, just a case of someone babysitting, a white man babysitting uh, to uh, white children and he was followed and the police were called. And so while I talk a lot about the police, understand that it's that macro micro tension. It is other people, everyday people elevating this and making it criminal and then calling in state sponsored uh, uh, actors who are more likely uh, to engage in a violent attack. The fifth frame is it's all white space. We just let you use it sometimes. Uh, and I remember uh, from my time at the University of Mississippi uh, and I have great, uh, great friends, great experiences and and, and some awful ones uh, too uh, from being there. And I remember uh, the way uh, walking to a, um, a meeting in Bernard uh, in the observatory and um, it was six o'clock at night and uh, and several white young men uh, in trucks, in a truck uh, dressed in what I perceived as like fraternity gear uh, called me the N word. And I was taken aback because that hadn't happened to me but I was there at six o'clock at night. Uh, and so uh, people behaved during those regular hours. And I was so taken aback that I said, excuse me. And they called out again and, and the word lingered, lingered. Um, and so discussions, I remember of uh, underground discussions of calling Tuesdays in front of the student union, uh, ghetto Tuesdays. That's when, uh, when we seed that space uh, to certain uh, groups, but understand, don't ever forget, it's it's all white space. We just let you use it uh, sometimes. And we see that in examples about um, about hair and regulations that get uh, uh, get put into place in various places about what is professional and what's uh, unprofessional. So it's the idea that my body is yours to regulate, my hair is yours to regulate, my home is yours to regulate, public spaces, including parks and streets, are uh, or are yours uh, to regulate. So why does this all matter? And I was doing better on time than I thought, so I might go back to this one for a second. What do I mean? Uh, it's all white space. We just let you use it sometimes. Well, I talked about an example at the University of Mississippi. Uh, I also talk about, uh, about an example. Many of you probably heard of barbecue uh, Becky or Permit, uh, Permit Patty, uh, who accused a uh, a young black girl who was selling water on the street, like you can't sell uh, sell water here. Okay, thank you so uh, so very much for that uh, for that reminder. And um, so when we have a home, there was a case. Uh, Amber Geiger, who was a, a police officer, she was off duty. She went into a home that she thought was hers, an apartment, but she was on the wrong floor. Uh, and she um, she killed uh, the person, Botham John, who was there. Uh, and she over and over again said that it was 
my home. Uh, this person was an intruder in my home, even up to and through the trial, continued to uh, talk about the space as hers to regulate and understand that that my other degree and my first job was law. Uh, and so that harkens back to the castle doctrine. Uh, and the castle doctrine is the same way uh, the basis upon which stand your ground laws were developed that allowed Zimmerman to walk away from this free. So it was an attempt to uh, expand the castle doctrine and say uh, that, yeah, this is, uh, this is my, I was defending my home, my property, and that's why my killing of him in his home was justified. Uh, so I think that this is a very important conversation. Uh, I think it's also important, I adopted uh, or copy this, uh, this image. We have focused our understanding of continuing violence against black bodies uh, on, on the part above this line. Is it a lynching? Is it the N word? Is it the burning of crosses? And in so doing, uh, we have said that that's socially unacceptable but we fail to realize that overt, uh, that covert white supremacy uh, happens in many ways that we fail to talk about and fail to acknowledge. And so I am grateful for the opportunity to share that with you today. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Combs. So much about that talk resonates with me so much about reading your book and knowing so much about your personal experience as well uh, does the same and I'm sure that that's doing the same for many others who are watching today so please put any questions that you have in the chat I have a few of my own so I'll start with one as we gather but actually I'll start with a comment as I was reading and and you started this talk with distinguishing welcoming black bodies from black embodiment which I found really interesting and in your book discussion, I just kept thinking about comedian and activist Dick Gregory's observation that white Southerners don't care how close Black folks get as long as they don't get too rich, and white Northerners don't care how rich they get as long as they don't get too close. And I know that it's nuanced, but that frame, I think, encapsulates so much of what you were saying, saying here, Dr. Combs. Okay, I think that we're still looking at questions, so I'll go ahead. Um, I'm, I, I, you talk about a particular section of your book, and I, there's so many jewels in the book that I do want to give you a chance to introduce maybe a few other things so that folks can, can get a sense of the wide breadth that you cover here. And I'm going to read my question, Dr. Combs, so that I don't forget anything. If I'm too informal, <laughs> I'll forget. But you, you title one of your chapters, Testifying. You showed that in your list of chapters and sections. And I read so much of this book through a Black theological tradition, and you do something similar with this concept of witnessing, and that's from looking historically at the work that Ida B. Wells Barnett did to Darnella Frazier documenting and witnessing the murder of George Floyd. Can you talk about some of those themes and, and the significance there in the book? Thank you. I was uh, I was calling uh, one of my friends out in the uh, in the chat. I'm going to stop that. Uh, so and I'll hit send and then uh, then <laughs> answer your question. Yeah. So for me, the idea of testify. Uh, I was writing this for years, but it became really most pressing uh, during COVID when in truth, I didn't know if I would be here tomorrow. Um, and so that meant, and my family uh, had COVID, my mother who has um, dementia, Alzheimer's and other issues uh, was hospitalized for 12 days. Uh, my sister uh, came to help and she ended up being hospitalized for 17 uh, days. Uh, my husband and I were both the fact that I didn't know if I would live tomorrow and I wanted people to know because I have 
some letters behind my name, I thought somebody might listen. And, and by that, I mean that I don't share other than what I call the uh, common everyday wisdom of Black folk, uh, that we need to understand these things in order to safely navigate space, to move from point A to point B and to get there alive and maybe on time, right? Uh, and so it's the common everyday wisdom. I was struck by the fact my first career was law and I was struck by the fact that um, the first time the Supreme Court found um, social science evidence compelling, it was the Dolls experiment uh, in the Brown case. And so I wanted to leave something that would testify in case I was gone. And I hope that people might, uh, might listen. I wanted to speak to my children and anyone else who saw the world the way I did to say, you are not crazy. I also wanted to share some of the, uh, the things that we as black folk, you know, we don't share uh, with our white uh, with our white friends uh, because uh, we just uh, we just can't. Uh, so uh, so I, I see that there are other questions. So I'm going to stop uh, stop talking. But thank you. Yes, I wanted to testify. There are questions coming up, so I'll get to it. We have one from Jillian Russell. Could you take a little bit more? But can you talk a little bit more about self-appointed white allies? and what white students on campus could do to evoke change without overstepping. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that question. Uh, one of the things, you know, in, in my church, uh, good old church tradition, and I always say, while in many ways I was an outsider as a Black uh, person in a position of authority at the University of Mississippi, I was also quite cognizant because I identify as Christian, and that's an important part of my identity, that there are ways that I was an insider. Uh, so there was talk like not do you have a faith belief system it was always do, you know where do you go to uh to uh to church and so in my church tradition they always say that you have two of these <laughs> right and you got one of these and so you should be listening more than you talk and so uh I, I i want white allies to listen and to listen with more than their ears i want you to listen with your whole being because if i say i'm fine that doesn't mean uh that i'm fine it may mean that I choose not to speak on it right now, because if I do, I am going, the floodgates uh, are going to open. And I want you to interrogate your own actions. Uh, there are many, uh, you know, I would rather have uh, I, I'd, I'd rather spend time with somebody who I know is against me than somebody who believes that they are for me and everything that they do uh, is hurtful. And so stop trying to defend yourselves. Stop trying to, uh, to rationalize uh, and spend time uh, listening with more than, your, uh, more than your ears. Thanks, Dr. Combs. So we have several more questions and comments coming up. One is actually from uh, Dr. Ryan Parsons, where he wants you to think about, or he, he asked that you think about uh, the reverse of um, Black bodies being welcome, but not Black embodiment. So situations where Black embodiment might be welcome, yep. like yep. thinking of cases like racist fraternity parties or the way yep. that white people engage with blues music culture. Yep. And uh, he asked if you see this dynamic contributing to the larger model of racism you're describing. Absolutely. And Brandy Summers Thompson writes about that in, I'm going to forget the name of her book, but she calls uh, that concept Black aesthetic emplacement. Um, and so it is the idea where it's welcomed, invited uh, uh, for uh, purposes, and it might be, you know, uh, voyeurism, it might be for, uh, for profit, um, an invitation in, particularly she interrogates the gentrification of h core in DC, uh, which was a black uh, thoroughfare, but now invites what she calls black aesthetic emplacement of black uh, and has cultural tours and uses images like uh, like this. And and the um, the businesses are largely owned by uh, by whites who invite that as a way. It's a form of uh, you know of capital uh, of capitalism, but other problematic ways that. 
that is uh, seeing other questions. I can't speak more on that, but I think that that's an insightful observation, uh, and uh, and I appreciate the um, uh, the provocation. Thanks, Dr. Combs. And your friend Al Steele does have a, a comment. <laughs> <in there>. <laughs> <laughs> And the question for some uh, something for you to think through. She says that she just had a meeting with an African American female student right before this session. The student was frustrated with the lack of safe space on campus for Black students to enjoy themselves without this white gaze. You were talking about this quote "ghetto Tuesday" earlier, mm -hmm. and saying that it's still a thing. She hears it all the time from white students. Uh, she also described Oxford police using police horses to push Black students off the sidewalk in October and November. She's at a loss of how to help them and wants to know if you have any thoughts on that. Ooh-wee. I, I, I think the thought is, I appreciate, again, introducing it in this space and talking about it. People assume that this stuff still doesn't go on and to the extent that it does, that it is the exception and not, uh, and not the rule. And so I really used to think the phrase speak truth to power, you know, was, uh, uh, was trite, uh, but the fact of, of, of voicing it and framing it in that way uh, is important. Important uh, is important for us uh, for us to do, and it is also important uh, to um, uh, to recognize that this uh, chapter ten of the book uh, I call it the weight um, that it places an 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 undue an additional weight and burden both on uh, both on you know black and brown faculty who want to nurture uh, and help uh, students uh, and uh, and on the students who now there is a fear of should I avoid such uh, spaces it is it invites uh, what. Uh, what many times, you know, uh, opposers want, and that is not a full bringing of your uh, humanity and presence uh, to a space. And so interrogating uh, that is its own kind of, of power. I have decided for myself in this period uh, that I will continue to have hope because hope itself is a radical act uh, of resistance. I Thanks, hope that Dr. Was responsive, but we can talk offline. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Combs. So you mentioned this quote from Dr. Ayuar, and I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly yeah. as well earlier about uh, this notion that subordinated groups can also be complicit in maintaining and defending yep. white supremacy. And, yep. and Danielle Townsend, I think, is is posing a question related to that about. Mm -hmm. Um, colorism and maybe even how people express themselves, for example, in terms of hair texture, how things like that might play into about yeah. the BOP theory that you propose. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. How thoughtful. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, I do invite um, and, and I do this for myself at the end of the book um, and, and throughout. I try to out myself in ways that I too have adopted uh, this kind of white uh, uh, white racial uh, frame uh, that says that certain people uh, perhaps brought things on themselves or that certain you know uh, good and and bad and so one of those that I talk about is a case in um, in Georgia uh, where Richard Brooks uh, was killed. Um, uh, and and I and I talk about how I had to work through that uh, myself, and so I think about some of my own language over the course of my 57 years of life. So I will forgive myself because I'm a little older, but I grew up very deeply entrenched in notions of good and bad hair, uh, like uh, a hair texture, uh, like my own natural state wasn't uh, uh, you know wasn't good, or how did you know how did you yeah those kind of uh, of ideas are very very troubling uh very crippling you know uh, uh pit us uh, against each other and so i i do think going back to my christian traditions let a man examine himself or her herself that there is work that all of us need to do because this frame is so deeply ingrained in the way that we are socialized in everything that we see uh that we even as black and brown and uh, other colored people 
but we have to recognize that we participate in it uh, as, as, as well and stop doing uh, that harm uh, to each other. And as my hair thins, I have a stronger recollection that hair is good. Right, Chuck Ross? I see you. Ah! <laughs> We went to law. Oh, well, he was at Ohio State while I was uh, at law school. So I, I but I, I um, uh, Tristam Shanty, what am I doing? I digress. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Combs. I'm sure you see that we have other comments and questions, but we do need to wrap up so that we can get respect your time and everyone else's and get out of here by one. I just want to say uh, thank you so much to everyone who's participated today, all of the questions you've asked, and special thanks to Dr. Combs for your candor and your thoughtfulness and your critical reflections throughout this book and throughout this talk. And obviously, we need a part two here. <laughs> thanks, everybody. I also want to thank, do some thanks. <laughs> thank you to Dr. Skipper. Thank you, Dr. Combs, for your time, um, for sharing your work with us. It was great to see you even in a virtual space. And as Dr. McKee said, as you, uh, as we were joining, that it was great that it was virtual because the weather in some places is not so great. So this allowed for it to happen safely with no stress. If you joined some, um, thank you to the audience for joining us today. If you joined a little behind and are like, ah, I wish I hadn't missed any of that, it will be up on our, on the center's YouTube um, page, hopefully in the next week or two, okay? We are, um, I don't know, upgrade as Beyonce says. We've got a survey, take your phone, hold it up to the QR code and take the, the survey. I will also email it to you. I have everyone's emails and the registration. Um, I will share the chat with Dr. Combs so that if there are some follow-up questions, um, she can maybe send some responses and I can get those to, to people. You can also look her up um, on Kennesaw State. She might also put her email address in the chat um, in case you want to follow up with her directly. Upcoming events next week, we have two. Wednesday at noon, again, Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr. is joining us. He is an associate professor of history from Texas Christian University. He will be in the building in Barnard Observatory, giving a talk on, I don't wanna say the wrong thing. How do I reconcile with race in the classroom? He's a dynamic person. So I think that it will be a great one to join um, if you can. On Thursday, February 9th, film screening of Promised Land, a story about Mount Bayou with three, um, a panel of three Mount Bayou natives that live there still today, the Johnsons. Um, Herman Johnson Sr. Um, is the father and his two sons, Daryl and Herman Johnson Jr. will be a part of a panel moderated by Dr. Castell Sweet. This is a partnership with the Center for Community Engagement in which Dr. Sweet is the director, um, along with Ralph Eubanks, who will provide some opening remarks um, and be a part of that panel as well. So next week, exciting talks, keeping with our theme of race in the classroom. As always, thank you all for joining us. One more thing, since I didn't talk at the beginning, thank you to Rebecca Cleary for promoting our self-talks on all the different platforms, for Katie McKee, Dr. McKee, and Jimmy Thomas for insights as we um, finalize and get the, the lineup together and to Lily Slaughter, the graduate assistant, Southern Studies graduate assistant who works with me, who does the newsletter, the monthly newsletter and all of the graphics. Thank you all and have a great afternoon. Bye.